So I wanted to show a couple of cases. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, everything is really focused in on the six-hour time window for intervention, and that's where we're collecting data. And that is the, you know, that is pretty much the, the average time for an intervention. But unfortunately, or fortunately, the patients who end up in our EDs are not the average person. It's an individual, and they're all a bit different. So here, uh, you know, uh, I guess uh, Dr. Mueller, uh, you know, showed that he has the the 90 uh, year old cutoff. Uh, we don't we don't have a cutoff. This is a 95 year old female, past medical history of atrial fibrillation, pretty much everything possible. However, her modified rankings uh, uh, score was zero, and she was uh, doing doing fine, you know, with a little bit of help from her family. So her last known well was at uh, 9:30 the night before. And she woke up at 8.30 with aphasia, with right-sided weakness, and uh, right-sided loss of sensation. She was brought in by her family to the Cleveland Clinic ED. And, you know, there's always a question whether sh anything should be done. I mean, we have no idea when these symptoms started. So, <clears throat> basically, this is her non-contrast CT, and it shows a density in the uh, distal middle cerebral artery, and there is actually a cutoff in the M2 segment there of the uh, middle cerebral artery. So this person is definitely having a stroke, but the question is, obviously, she's not an, an eligible for TPA by uh, the criteria, but can anything be done? And uh, at the Cleveland Clinic, what we do is we have MRI available 24-7. So she was rolled into MRI. Uh, it's kind of like an assembly line. Uh, CT, CTA, and then if there's a large vessel occlusion, but they're beyond the six-hour window, then we take them to MRI right away. Um, and all we do is diffusion. The whole thing takes about seven minutes, seven to ten minutes max, depending on how quickly we can transfer the patient. And this is her MR MRI, and she has tiny, tiny uh, strokes that have been completed already in the uh, temporal lobe. But overall, there's a lot of salvageable brain here. We don't do perfusion because we basically use the clinical exam as, uh, you know, as a as as a way to um, basically assess what is the area that is under perfused, the area that's not functioning. And this is her angiogram. So that's the uh, occlusion here uh, that that we saw on the CTA. And uh, so here we have, uh, I've crossed the occlusion with a microcatheter. There's the solitaire stent across the, uh, across the clot. And this is actually perfusion through the solitaire stent. So that's that temporary bypass that we, that we um, have. And then afterwards, uh, we've recanalized her. And she did great. She did not actually have an infarct. She did not go on to complete the infarct. And she's doing well. Actually, I got a text uh, yesterday from her geriatrician saying that she's doing fantastic. So... Um, anyway, uh, I think these cases are interesting, you know, because we can, uh, just like Dr. Mueller was showing, there are some patients who are very fast progressors, and it all depends on uh, the initial anatomy and also on the patient's blood pressure. So, you know, uh, when we have that whole graph, um, which I'll show right here. So, basically, what, what, you know, what really matters is the patient's anatomy and, and, and their blood pressure. So, when you have a clot, uh, you start having an infarct in the uh, distribution of that clot, but how fast that infarct grows really depends on collateral circulation and the, and the patient's blood pressure. And uh, here are our classic graphs, basically, which uh, show what well, we all know, that for every, every 30 minutes, the chances of a meaningful recovery go down by about 10%, and that's why... On average, you know, we want to treat these patients as fast as possible. However, you know, it all depends on whether the data is clustered like this or whether the data is more scattered. And actually, this is kind of more, more uh, to the way that, the, you know, patients in real life present. So some patients can still be salvageable way out there, you know, like uh, many, many, many hours beyond the six-hour window. And uh, so here's another patient, again, uh, she was discovered at 10 in the morning uh, by, a, by a friend, brought to the ED, uh, confused, not filing commands. Uh, again, she would not really, you know, we have no idea what the time of onset is here, but this is her MRI right before. It's completely clear. She does have a occlusion of the middle cerebral artery here. So, um, again, you know, we, we go in, we restore this, open it up, 
and the patient's doing great. She just has a tiny little uh, infarct there, uh, kind of in the Centrum Simeo Valley. It's probably a little embolus during the case. And here's a most kind of like dramatic case of this. This was a 53-year-old female, and she was recently diagnosed with diabetes. And what happened was she took her medication in the afternoon, um, and then she became plegic on the left side. And she thought it was an allergic reaction, so she decided to go and sleep it off. And uh, she presented to the ED the next day, and I just got a courtesy, you know, like a, a call from the ED physician, and they said, well, so we think this patient is having a stroke. However, there's nothing anybody's going to do because this is like, it's been so long. But, uh, you know, so this is her, uh, this is her CTA, and there's a clot here in the middle cerebral artery. But this is her MRI, and yeah, indeed, she's not moving uh, her left side. However, this is the area that has already been infarcted. It's very small compared to the area that can potentially be salvaged. So this is her angiogram, and you can see that there's a lot of uh, profusion. This is, all of this is uh, basically under profuse tissue, and her stroke is somewhere, somewhere in there. So I ended up uh, taking out the clot. She actually ended up having a stenosis there, so uh, I put in a stent. And, uh, and this is you know, before and this is after. And this is her MRI afterwards. This is her in my clinic. She's doing great. The only deficits are like, you know, uh, basically she couldn't really move her hand when it was like uh, way up there when she was trying to put on uh, some kind of like braids in her hair, but everything else is perfect. And she, she did end up having a little hemorrhage here. We kind of knew that would happen. That's the risk that you take. You know, the, the infarcted brain is the brain that's going to probably hemorrhage, but, you know, the hemorrhage is, is going to be small, probably contained, and um, and patients usually do well. So anyway, just just kind of like I think that's that's pretty much the future also to try to triage patients beyond the standard uh, you know aspect scores and uh, and uh, and 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 just not not really look at the windows, but look at the individual patient and their physiology. And uh, so this is <coughs> this is what we do at the Cleveland Clinic now the patient, because we're trying to capture as many patients as possible that can be helped. And so if a patient presents within uh, four and a half hours, you know, they get CT, CTA, they get the IV, TPA, and mechanical thrombectomy. This is what we're trying to capture, I guess, with all, all our, uh, you know, mechanical thrombectomy less than six hours. So CT, CTA, mechanical thrombectomy, if they're less than six hours. For, but for the patients that the time is unknown, or a wake-up stroke, or greater than six hours, they get the diffusion-weighted MRI, which again only takes about seven to ten minutes. And if uh, there's not a big stroke, we go ahead and do mechanical thrombectomy on them. <coughs> Any questions? No, we're not doing any CT perfusion. So there's many different ways of looking at uh, brain viability. So CT perfusion uh, shows you that there is an underperfusion there, okay? But it doesn't really give you the physiological brain that has died. Uh, the only really way you can look at that is, is actually diffusion-weighted images, you know? CT perfusion infers that there is, you know, the collaterals and how much, how much uh, underperfused brain there is, but it doesn't <laughs> actually give you that, you know, the fact whether the brain has died or not. So uh, diffusion-weighted MRI is, is what we do. We don't do any perfusion because the perfusion data is actually the patient's deficit. We've had the experience now that we do this parallel process where we're driving in as the patient's being put on the table. They go through the CT, CTA, CT perfusion, but I'm already driving. I often don't have time to look at the study. So I, you know, patients then draped, I run in, I do the case, come out and look at the perfusion. I'm like, whoa, this is all core. And I'm like, well, I should have looked at this before I went into this case. And then the next morning, the patient's like, hey, how are you doing? And has just, you know, a couple of punctate areas of restricted perfusion. So if you're really fast, perfusion may, especially if you're looking at blood volume, maybe not the, uh, the time to peak maps that they use with rapid, but other, you know, the, the traditional blood volume maps may overestimate the actual <coughs> core infarct initially. So if you're really fast, um, they're almost like fal false positive. I have the same experience. So I actually, I don't trust the CT perfusion in the very early strokes. However, beyond three hours, 
I do. And uh, actually, uh, with us, the, the one that we use at Holy Cross, it very accurately uh, shows or predicts the eventual infarct that next day we can see on uh, uh, diffusion scan. So that's an excellent question. So everything happens, uh, you know, just like everywhere else. It's, it's kind of parallel processing. So we try to get the information from the family immediately when the patient comes in, whether they're a candidate for an MRI. You know, not everybody is a candidate for an MRI. But if we don't have that information, what we do is we do a head-to-toe scout uh, image on, in the CT scanner. And that shows us if there's any metal, if there's any wires or anything like that. So. Right, so not, not all patients get an MRI. It's the patients that are beyond the six hour window. And right, I mean, not everybody can get it and, and, and it's not going to, to work for, for everyone, but, uh, but you know, the vast majority of patients can, so yeah.